Okay, well our discussion this morning is called Alive and Well in the Spirit. So let's get some spirit going. Now this is a tweak on a high school cheer. Class of 72 right here, go Edison Eagles. Woo, woo, woo. Okay, so this is a tweak on a cheer that we would yell across the football field to, or whatever, basketball court, to the opposing team folk. And remember this is a little tweak. I've got the spirit. Yes, I do. I've got the spirit. How about you? <laughs> okay, great. Well, now to answer the question, what does it look like? What is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian? Well, let me give you a simple visual, and it pretty much says it all. Okay, this is one of Mark's work gloves. Not a whole lot of power going on, right? So until Mark puts his hand in the glove, then he can do all sorts of stuff, if he only knew what, how to do it. But anyway, I think my mic is gonna fall off here. I'm getting too spirited. Anyway, okay, so, this is the Christian. Now what does the Holy Spirit look like in the life of a Christian? Power, spirit power. I could stop now, but I won't. That pretty much, you know, says it. Speaking of Holy Spirit visuals in the church, our primary ones are the dove and the flame, as you know. Mark 1, 9 through 11 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water... He saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Now Matthew 3 and Luke 3 also tell of this event. And as a bonus, we disciples use these verses to explain why we immerse instead of sprinkling or pouring water on folk in their baptisms. Jesus was immersed, so we immerse. Now, of course, baptisms by sprinkling and pouring of water are, are just, just as valid. And the flame for the Holy Spirit? You know, the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared upon them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, foreign languages, not glossolalia, which is the term for speaking in tongues, speaking foreign languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now another flame, or a candle flame. This is a decoupage. Do people decoupage anymore? Well, this was given to me 49 years ago by Joanne. And it says, be a glow with the spirit. And I uh, led Joanne to uh, Jesus Christ. And this was a gift uh, of gratitude. And so I've had this displayed in my various church offices and it's up above a shelf in our kitchen to be a glow with the spirit. Romans 12, 11 says, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, or be fervent in spirit, or be a glow with the spirit. Serve the Lord. Now for some definitions. We'll be looking at the realities of spirit and Holy Spirit. And this information is from the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, my uh, go-to for most things biblical and religious. In both Hebrew and Greek, the root meaning of spirit is a movement of air, wind, or breath. And by extent, extension, it becomes the principle of life, life principle for us. Genesis 1 declares the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Creation is underway. The Spirit is, and I quote, 
the divine element in humans indicated first by the view that we are created in the image of God. That's Genesis 1:27, which means that we are by nature like God and that we have intelligence, free will, and we are moral beings, end quote. Well, that's the hope at least. In Romans 8, 8 through 17, Paul shares his belief that it is our spirit which allows us to be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. From the IDB, I quote, it is the spiritual nature with which God has endowed every human being and makes it possible for the Spirit of God to dwell in us. It provides a basis for the continuing conversation, and I like that, continuing conversation between our spirit and the divine spirit, or the Holy Spirit, who comes to dwell in us, end quote. Well, I sort of had this image of Legos, you know, or a magnet, our spirit and the Holy Spirit. Well, what about the spirit and the soul? We don't sing rock of my spirit in the bosom of Abraham. Well, several years ago off the internet, I uh, copied this article by Wayne Jackson, have no idea who he is, uh, christiancourier.com. And so he is, gives us a few helpful um, ideas. What is the difference between the spirit and soul of a human being? There's no simple answer to this question because the word soul and spirit are employed in varying senses within the different biblical contexts in which they may be found. So a few things about soul. Soul may signify merely an individual person. In some contexts, soul simply has reference to biological life, the animating principle that is common to both humans and beasts or animals. The soul is the eternal component of man, and I'm just gonna use the sexist language, component of man that is fashioned in the very image of God, Genesis 1:26, which we affirmed, and that can exist apart from the physical body. Now spirit, spirit may refer to the inward man, that's 2 Corinthians, that is fashioned in the image of God, so it can, you know, thus a synonym for, with soul. A sacred writer, and this is from Proverbs, a sacred writer noted that the spirit of man is the lamp of Jehovah. I love that. Be aglow with the spirit, the lamp of Jehovah. This is an allusion to the element of man that distinguishes him from the beasts of the earth. Now spirit, Spirit sometimes stands for a person's disposition or attitude, either for bad or good, the spirit of fear, that's 2 Timothy, a meek and submissive spirit, that's 1 Peter, in reference to wives, we should have a meek and submissive spirit. You're supposed to go, boo, hiss. <laughs> or a spirit of gentleness in Galatians 6. Okay, well for me personally, and aside from songs, I don't use the word soul very much. I use spirit, as in my spirit. Here's an interesting text. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. This is Paul's prayer for his readers as he anticipates the soon coming of Christ. May the God of peace himself sanctify you. That means to make holy, to set apart. Sanctify you and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound or complete and blameless at the coming of our Lord. Well, the commentary states that Paul's spirit, soul, body is not the Greek understanding of the three parts of the human, but it's the Jewish method of describing our whole being from different points of view. On to the Holy Spirit. Again, sharing from the IDB, and I'm going to quote this slowly because there's a lot packed in here. In reference to the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is the mysterious power of God conceived in the first place 
as the mode of God's activity manifested especially in supernatural revelation to selected individuals and in their being possessed by a force which gave them marvelous strength, think of Samson, courage, wisdom, and the knowledge of God's will and his dealings with humans. An example would be interpreting dreams. Joseph and Daniel you know, come to mind. Still referencing the Old Testament. Later, God's spirit is identified with his personal presence and regarded as the, the distinctive endowment of his people. Now let me share uh, Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. It's wonderful. It's used in Lent and um, just is just wonderful. <laughs> Created me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Now sustain, that's some foreshadowing of what we're gonna hear in a little bit. A willing spirit, sustain in me. Now in the New Testament, quoting, the Holy Spirit is understood as the mode of God's operation in the church, made possible through the work of Christ and mediating the glorified Christ to his people and the church to its exalted head. Now usually we say Jesus before resurrection, Christ post-resurrection, but I'm gonna say we. Anyway, that's how some people distinguish that. Well, in both the Old Testament and New Testament, the phenomena of ecstasy are not the most important effects of spirit possession. You thought of spirit possession? It's, oh. <laughs> Nor are they proof of it, end quote. Well, I say amen to that. I do not agree with those who state that the speaking in tongues is uh, the litmus test for being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I differentiate between God's Spirit and the Holy Spirit? Well, technically, they're the same. But personally, I think of God's Spirit with the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit with the New Testament. And with the written word, I know this is obvious, if Spirit has a capital S, I think Holy Spirit or God's Spirit. Small letter S, I think the human spirit. The Holy Spirit is called different names in the New Testament, giving us wonderful images for how he relates to us. Advocate, comforter, counselor, helper. The English word paraclete is from a Greek word meaning to come alongside of. I love that image, the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us, paraclete. Think of the words cleave, cleavage. We, <laughs> gotta have x-rated here. We celebrate Pentecost on the birthday of the church. You know that. The Holy Spirit was poured out over the believers, so the Holy Spirit is the lifeblood of the church. He keeps God's grace flowing in and among us as individuals and as the church body gathered. Now the Trinity is a doctrine created by the church, capital C, to explain the relationship and activity between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, or as I call it, God of the third power. The best explanation of the Trinity that I've ever come across, and I don't know who came up with it, and it absolutely nails it, and the pun is somewhat intended, absolutely nails um, who God is in the three parts. God the Creator, Jesus the Redeemer, Holy Spirit is the sustainer. Remember that foreshadowing. The Holy Spirit sustains within each of us and within the church God's grace and God's loving power and presence we know in Jesus Christ. God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Now I'm theocentric in my faith, which means that I go to God first primarily in my daily walk. That is how I live out 
my Christian faith. Some Christians go to Jesus as their primary connection. A lot of contemporary Christian songs are Christocentric. A lot of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then there are some Christians who go to the Holy Spirit as their primary connection. As believers, obviously we can pray to God, Jesus, you know, the Holy Spirit. And we'll be praying to the Spirit as a closing for this, for our time today. Now the giving of the Holy Spirit Spirit is depicted in four ways, at least in the four scriptures that I'm sharing. We've already mentioned at creation, Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit of God moving over the face of the waters. I have to be honest and say that I never associated the Holy Spirit with the creation story until I prepared this lesson. I still lean heavily with the Holy Spirit being New Testament and um, God's Spirit being Old Testament. A second way that we see the giving of the Holy Spirit is the story of Pentecost, which we've already looked at. A third way is Jesus blowing on the disciples in John 20, verses 20 through 22. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now the fourth depiction I credit to Walter Scott, a prominent quasi-founder of our denomination with his evangelism technique of the five-finger exercise. He helped bring people to faith in Jesus Christ um, in the 1830s. Um, out on the frontier, and all he needed was his hand and Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Scott would begin with his little finger, believe and come to faith in Jesus Christ, repentance of your sins, baptism, symbolic of your new life in Christ and being birthed into the church universal, forgiveness, you receive God's forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit. So if you want to help somebody come to faith in Jesus Christ, just pull out your hand. <laughs> so faith, repentance, baptism, forgiveness, and gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, these aren't always sequential. I mean, they, you know, for me, as soon as you repent of your sins, you know, you're forgiven of whatever you're, you're repenting. Um, you know, baptism does not save a person, and you can be baptized, you know, whenever. Ideally, you know, it's close to when you uh, come to faith. But anyway, faith, repentance, baptism, forgiveness, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to share two recent faith smacks on the forehead that I've received. The first one is thanks to Connie McFarland. Where are you, darling? Back there, okay. Well, I spoke to you about grace several months ago, and I shared my conversion experience with you and mentioned about this warm flush that moved from my head down my body. And I've always said it was a wonderful confirmation of what I had just done. And Connie came up to me after I'd finished and said, that warm flush you felt was probably grace. I just looked at her wide-eyed in shock. For 51 years of being a Christian, I had never identified that warm flush as being grace. I thought, well, how dumb have I been all these years? So that was smack number one. Thank you, Connie. Smack number two came during the recent lesson by Larry about John's gospel, and we were talking about the Holy Spirit. And one lady in the back of the room on this side, and I'm, I don't know who, who she was, who she is, she had shared a time she'd had prayed about an urgent need and had felt this warm flush move from her head to her feet and she named it 
the Holy Spirit. For 51 years as a Christian, I had never identified the warm flesh as the Holy Spirit. Are you here today by any chance? Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> please know that not feeling a warm flush or any other bodily expression uh, means no presence of the Holy Spirit. I just now have names for what that, that warm flush I experienced. You see, we never <laughs> stop learning and growing. Amen. Well, I now want to share some uh, Holy Spirit texts with you. And these are from the NRSV. The first one is Matthew 12, verses 22 through 32, the story in which the unforgivable sin uh, that is blaspheming the Holy Spirit is discussed. I know some people struggle, maybe none of you, but you know, this unfor unforgivable sin. And as you know, blasphemy is insult or contempt, uh, disrespect, lack of reverence shown to God or the sacred. And in the story, the blasphemy comes when people claim Jesus is in league with, with the devil, with Satan. And it's kind of long. The story's called Jesus and Beelzebub. Then they brought to him a demoniac who was blind and mute, and he cured him so that the one who had been mute could speak and see. All the crowds were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons, that this fellow casts out the demons. He knew what they were thinking and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Abraham Lincoln. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, people will be forgiven for every sin and blasphemy, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now the commentary says that the unforgivable sin is a sustained and constant refusal to recognize the Spirit's work in Jesus in performing God's will. So basically, it's saying that whenever Jesus is working good, that it's, you know, he's in league with the devil, which of course is not true. So that basically is what the unforgivable sin is against the Holy Spirit. The next one is Luke 4, that wonderful song about the Spirit. And actually, he's quoting uh, portions from Isaiah. When he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. Jesus was a good Jewish boy. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, I learned some more things here. <laughs> because he has anointed me. Now, you know about anointing. It means to make sacred or to consecrate something or someone for a higher purpose. Release to the captives. Now, I think most of us, or at least I have, for, for the large part, thought of that, of you know, getting people out of prisons. Release the captives. But 
a second learning I have about that is he's referencing releasing people from sin and diabolic power, thus freeing folks who are captive to their sin and, you know, diabolic powers. Okay, release the captives. Next one is John 16, uh, 5 through 15, and it's entitled here, The Work of the Spirit. In John's Gospel. Spirit is very big in John's Gospel. And again, Jesus talking. <clears throat> I did not say these <clears throat> things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and in judgment because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So basically Jesus is, you know, his death, resurrection, and ascension complete his work. And now the paraclete's ministry cannot be undertaken until Jesus leaves. Jesus is passing the baton to the Holy Spirit saying, okay, You've got, them, you've got them now. Continue to show them the grace and the truth of who we are. All right, Romans 8. My lips keep sticking together. I love this scripture, Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Some versions say with groans too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. That's us, according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit prays for believers through intercession. Now, my funny story about this text, about the Spirit praying in groans, sighs too deep for words. Um, when I was doing my chaplain residency in Boston, they had worked out housing for me at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge. And so, of course, it's a dormitory and there were communal bathrooms co-ed, I might tell you. I told the, the lady giving me the tour, I said, we don't do that in Oklahoma. And she said, well, we do here. And we're talking in the early 80s. Well, I don't know what it was, but, but one, it was just one day that I was just broken down. Uh, I don't know, worry, sadness, anxiety. I honestly don't remember what was troubling my, my spirit. But I do recall vividly going into the uh, bathroom at, at, down at the end of the hall. Nobody was there but me. And I'm washing out my pantyhose there in the sink. And I just, I remember this scripture. So literally, I just leaned over the sink and went, ah, ah. See, I figured that'd be the Holy Spirit <laughs> groaning in size too deep for words to help me. I'm so thankful nobody walked in and saw, saw me washing out my pantyhose <laughs> over the sink. But just know that's a backup if, if, you know, if you need it. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Uh, when I was younger, you know, this scripture was used a lot to try to discourage premarital sex, you know, for teens or whatever. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Well, that's a good scripture, obviously, for all of us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, glorifying God. We sing it. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, a temple, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. That gives meaning to that psalm. Now to 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5. Mr. Paul, he is so big on educating the church, building up people, uh, dispensing knowledge. So this bit is about uh, gifts of prophecy, which is like teaching and tongues. Pursue love and strive for the spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. For those who speak in a tongue do not speak to other people, but to God. For nobody understands them, since they are speaking mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, those who prophesy speak to other people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Those who speak in a tongue build up themselves, but those who prophesy build up the church. Now I would like all of you to speak in tongues, but even more so to prophesy. One who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now there are gifts of speaking in tongues and gifts of interpretation. And other places Paul says, you know, don't speak in tongues unless someone is there to interpret, you know, what you have said. And then, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. And then the last one is in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. It's called the threefold blessing. And I imagine some churches may use this as benediction or a part of their liturgies or whatever. Anyway, it just got the name, the threefold blessing from the church. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Communion of the Holy Spirit. Communion is an intimate relationship with a deep understanding. You know, every Sunday as disciples, we experience communion with Jesus at his table. Communion with the Holy Spirit. When we're doing that, that's what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. I want to share now two examples of what communion with the Holy Spirit looks like. And both are from one of the uh, devotions in this 365 days of spiritual growth. I'm sorry, 365 days of spiritual growth. Um, <clears throat> and the first one is, was part of a sermon that I gave at one of the Green Country Walk to Emmaus, you know, Green Country Emmaus community. I know Harvard Avenue had a lot of folks in that. Or anybody here was a part of the Green Country? Okay. Well, you know, they would have periodic gatherings and they'd have somebody uh, come and, and talk or, or preach. And this is one of the, this was a part of the talk that I gave. And this is the graphic that's a part of this, this devotion. There are six circles here. The scripture is 1 Corinthians 2.12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. We are often told to count our blessings, but how often do we count the blessing of our blessings? And I put light bulb, the blessings of our blessings. Once bestowed by the Spirit, a blessing grows beyond what it originally was. Like a baby bird that is pecked through its shell, it is nurtured by the Spirit until it can leave its nest and soar toward heaven. The blessing soars higher and higher, and its flight path is radiant with the light of God, or the flame of God. On a sheet of paper, oh, okay, it says to draw these circles. Ta-da. 
right inside the first circle one way that your life has been blessed by the Spirit. Next, draw a second interlocking circle and write in it how the first blessing led to another. Continue in this way for a third blessing, for so on. This series of interlocking circles represents the flight path of your original blessing. All blessings have flight paths. Each of them grows and soars beyond what it originally was. And celebrate this dynamic power of the Spirit witnessed at work in and through your life. Now, here's what I put in my circles. First one, uh, when I went to OU, I pledged Delta Gamma. And at one of our pledge meetings, someone from Campus Crusade for Christ came and spoke to us about, you know, what it means to have, you know, to be a Christian. Well, I, that was sort of the deciding factor for me, so that led me to accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now, my roommate, Kathy Newman, this was freshman, said, well, Kim, you're a Christian now, you find, need to find a church. Okay. So she invited me to her church, which was First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, downtown. And so I went to her church. I loved it, got involved in the college career class. Um, and then realized, you know, I want to go into men. I want to I be a teacher. I wanted to be and do what Richard Ziegler did, Minister of Christian Education. Um, and my minister, my first Christian minister, said, you can go to seminary, women can. Campus Crusade folks shunned me. That's against the Bible. And my minister said, you go for it. Well, not literally. Anyway, fifth circle. In the various churches, one of the churches I served was Forest Park Christian Church. And in Forest Park, I remember Barbara Moses, she said, Kim, have you ever been on a walk to Emmaus? And I said, no, I wanted to. She said, well, I want to sponsor you. And so Barbara sponsored me to go the walk to Emmaus. I loved it and became, you know, involved in the Green Country Emmaus. And so at one of their gatherings, I was asked to be the speaker. And I did. Here in this room, it was held at Harvard Avenue Christian Church. Back then it was the sanctuary. But, but now it's the challengers class. And here I am today telling you about that. Ooh. All right, the next one is this lovely <laughs> freehand. I did use the same lid for that. And this has to do with fruits of the spirit. Now you're all experts by now, the fruits of the spirit, since we talked about that a while back. Um, anyway, this devotion has this graphic, and I'm maybe blocking it. It's entitled, The Spirit is Always at Work in me. And this is Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For it is God who is at work in you. You know, you can think God of the third power. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, creator, redeemer, sustainer. The force of gravity is always at work in our lives. We may not be able to see gravity, but we can certainly see its effects. Just try to defy it. Do your best to jump off the surface of this earth. If you come back down again, give it another try. See if you can throw something so high into the air that it will not return to the earth. Try to place an object out in the empty space in front of you without it crashing to the ground. Gravity is a powerful force. Without it, life as we know it would not be possible. The same is true in the Spirit of God. It is ever present, or he, and ever hard at work in our lives. And even as gravity pulls us back to earth, the spirit draws us back to its center. In fact, the spirit is our center. When we move away from it, its power begins to work on us, drawing us back to the center. If we move on these lines, as we allow the Spirit to work in our lives, we see evidences or fruits of the Spirit. 
bingo. So the spirit is like the gravitational pull. Now I've got nine spokes here. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All those, all those fruits. Um, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Mark on each line where you find yourself right now. You know, how, how are you exhibiting joy? Anyway, so you just go through the lines. You know, where you, this is, I mean, you're really rocking and rolling here. But as you get further out, less evidence that you're exhibiting joy or gentleness or whatever. And so a prayer, you know, is conclude this exercise if you were to do that. Giving thanks for the power of the Spirit at work in your life. The Spirit is always at work in me. I had never really thought of the Spirit having like that gravitational pull. I mean, I did on one hand, but not just overtly. And so this helped remind me that the Spirit is always at work, reminding us, guiding us. Um, oh, it's some Old Testament, <laughs> some Old Testament verse. But I love it, you know, and when it talks about when we're, we're moving and we'll hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. You know, that's, that's the spirit. Okie dokie, well, I wanna close now with our song prayer. Uh, and for me, it, well, this celebrates our communion with the Holy Spirit. And for me, it really exemplifies the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Boom, right there. That says it all. Such vivid verbs. Melt us. I can't help but think of chocolate melting. Melt us. So we just, or the, you know, the wicked witch of the, <laughs> as she melts, melt us, spirit. Now, you can remold us. You know, start create us, create us again. Melt us, mold us, fill us. Just pour those fruits of your spirit into us, and then use us. Send us out. Melt, mold, fill, use. Oh yes, spirit of the living God, fall afresh, fall afresh on us. Amen. Questions or comments? Thank you, Kim. Yep, hold on just a second. Be nice. <laughs> you know, first, thank you for a wonderful lesson. Oh, and when welcome. I saw that S in that circle, I thought it stood for sanctification. And, uh, and would you address the issue of sanctification, how you define it, and how it affects us? Um, well, I said this, to sanctify means to make holy or sacred. Basically, our, our daily walk in Christ is a process of sanctification. Those things that we do to live, uh, to allow the Spirit to work in us. Um, as I said before, I really believe that if we work on exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit in our lives, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, I mean, I don't think it gets much better than that. So sanctification basically means the process of becoming holy. However it works for you, for you in your personal life, your church life, um, that's the best I can do. Does that at least give you? So we're all in the process of sanctification. It sounds like we're gonna be frozen or something, but uh, anyway, that's, that's my belief. I just couldn't help but think when you were closing and talking about melting us, the warmth of grace. Oh, us. oh, girl, oh. <laughs> Smack number three. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
am now a totally different perspective. <laughs> I, I always go to the, That's common, okay. the common use of words today. And spirit, of, you did a great jo job with the cheer. You know, that's an action that you can exhibit. Yes. Common language, spirit. But what about soul? It's almost always associated with death in common language. Uncle Johnny's soul has left his body. Right. But here's a really interesting one. If, if you're talking about an airplane crash, yes. and there was 100 people on board, right. and they all died, all 100 souls, souls perished. And that's what that Wayne Jackson said. A lot of times it just refers to a, to a person. Yeah. And I didn't use a phrase, but thank you for that. And the souls were lost. Like I said, I really, you know, I really shared all I could about it. Uh, that doesn't mean that's obviously the sum total. If somebody has a, a better definition, I just, I just use spirit. But I know there's a lot of soul men. I mean, in songs, we talk about soul. So, Kim, thank you. You're welcome. Kim is my personal educator. Um, I ask her to speak about things I don't understand very well. And I've been really looking forward to the Holy Spirit lesson because I don't get it. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm glad all you said has helped me. But when I became baptized at 18, the Methodist Church minister told me that we had to believe in the Holy Trinity. Right, God, Jesus, right. and no, the Holy I, no, Spirit. I, okay. And I was 18 and said, I, I'm not sure about the Holy Spirit. Did he explain it? Oh, no, he didn't, exp he didn't explain it, which is the way you've explained it. I probably would have been more understanding of what it is. Yeah. But I, to me, as you're speaking today, there are times in my life that I now understand it was a Holy Spirit and not a God or a, most I thought it was God trying to tell me to do stuff, but now I'm pretty sure it was the Holy Spirit, okay. the sustainer, because of your wonderful lesson. Oh. So thank you for helping us have a better understanding of that, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost. I know. Holy Spirit. Yeah, Holy Ghost. That, I think, I, from the King James Version, I don't, you hear Holy... Praise God from whom all blessing fall. You know, Holy Ghost. I don't say ghost, I say spirit, but anyway. <laughs> well, good. Uh, yes. <laughs> we got one over here. I taught at an Episcopal school in Edmond. And every chapel day, Father Mark would say, raise your hand if you're holy. And he taught us all to raise our hands because he said, it means that you are set apart right. for a special purpose. God has set you apart. So that's, I mean, he taught those kids that they're all set apart for a special purpose. And that is why they're holy. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that is correct or not, but it really made a great impression on them and yes. on me too. You know what? You just gave me another smackaroo. You're, should I say you're full of it? In a good way. Okay, remember I said spirit, little s, the Holy Spirit, spirit. Well, going on what you said, if holy means set apart, especially, you know, here we have the word spirit, and by golly, we've lopped the word holy onto it. So we have made the spirit something extra special. Okay, great, thank you. The word, word nerd in me coming out again. Anybody else? Richard has one. This row doesn't count. <laughs> you can't. Well, I want to thank Kim for that wonderful lesson. Oh, you can have, you count. <laughs> a, a comment back here about the soul brought back a, a song into my mind, Rock of My Soul in oh, the absolutely. Bosom of Abraham. Which I means, I think, uh, we're all person. part of God's creative spirit is alive in all of us. Absolutely. From Absolutely. Abraham on down. And you more and than that's, some. And I'm so glad you closed with that last song because that has oh, been in it. my mind. Uh, I learned that as a youth sure. going to camp and conference. Mm -hmm. And that has meant so much to me in my faith to journey. Yes, it's wonderful. That, uh, it's the sign of God continues to work at our lives and is present with us always. Amen. 
Well, <laughs> this is just a scientific observation. <laughs> but if the Holy Spirit was like gravity uh -huh. or uh, <clears throat> like two charges attracting each other, yes. um, as you get closer to the Spirit, it gets stronger. Yeah. So this is not a stable, it's not a continuous force. Uh, if you get further away, it gets weaker. It's called the inverse square law. That's right. So you get closer, stronger, further away, weaker. That's good. But my final question is, you think the mainline denominations are trying to re reclaim the spirit? Well, Richard could probably speak to this more so than I. When I became a disciples of Christ and started learning all about us and went to seminary, I had heard from older disciples or older in the denomination that for a while there, disciples didn't want to mess much with the Holy Spirit because they didn't want to be maybe associated with the Pentecostal Holy Rollers. But then at one point they realized, how dumb are we? Of course. And so then more Holy Spirit language came into disciples' churches teaching, blah, blah, blah. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I was told by, he's nodding yes. So, um, that's all I know, but there's, I will say though, uh, when I became associate minister at Yale Avenue, Mike Albert was a pastor and he, you know, was big on uh, spiritual gifts. And I was like, huh? I hadn't heard about spiritual gifts. And so that's where I learned all about that and obviously have been teaching that ever since. So, so yeah, it just, you know, kind of, a lot of it depends on the individual churches and pastors too, so. Any other questions? Time to quit. Comments. Okay. Kim, we sure appreciate uh, all your work Thank you. on this. You're Thank you. Appreciate that. Did Did you want to Did you want to end with that Edison Spirit yell again? <laughs> Girl, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Edison, let's just say we've got the Spirit. Yes, we do. We've got the Spirit. How about you? Ready? We've got, got the spirit. spirit, yes we do. We've we got, got the spirit. spirit, how about you? <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Hey, we'll see you again next week, guys. Have a good week. Okie dokie.